Okay, welcome. Thursday, February 16. Our in-person session was canceled, and I'm going to do the best I can for you in this session. I'm going to take you on a tour of our website, and we'll talk about sections 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3, .3, which are kind of fun. Extensions of what we were doing in class at the end last time dealing with matrices and linear systems. Just some paperwork. Your homework is due tonight, as usual. And we'll allow some time for homework questions. If you like, since we're beginning kind of raggedly, after the first break, we'll set aside some time for homework questions if you want to see some visuals or something. There's an exam this week. The exam this week is a take-home exam, and it's going to be in place of your homework. So you can see on our website your homework schedule, how it lays for the next three to four weeks, even past spring break. And the exam, I'll show you where you can find your exam. And you will not hand any homework problems in next Thursday. You'll just be handing in the exam. So exam one is released. By 11.59 tonight. Thursday, February 16. It's five problems or four problems or six problems. Frankly, I'm gonna to have to go back and look at it. <laughs> I think it was four or five. And you know that problems sometimes will have multiple parts. So that kind of makes it hard to call it four or five problems. But if you like, you could consider them to be four to five homework problems. So that's double your homework load. Well, it's not quite double your homework load. You've been doing three to four homework problems, but these problems are not new, they're problems over the material you've been covering. They might be in a new format or a new question you haven't heard, but they're going to be problems from chapters one and chapter two. I'll show you where to find them. And it will be due one week from tonight. On Thursday, February 23. I think I can show you the title page of that. And then you'll understand the instructions and so forth. Maybe that's where we should begin. That's the wrong paper. That looks better. I'm just going to take a single page of that so I can show you. And let me share my screen with you to show you this title page. And then I'll show you where you'll find it on our website and everything else that's happening on our website this week. So this is exam one, and the instructions are presented here. Uh, kind of ordinary instructions, because even if there's a take-home exam and an in-class session, I still have to have some rules. I still have to have some rules for transferability. And so your signature on this title page is acknowledging that you follow these rules. I don't have any question about your integrity in this matter. But I do receive questions from transfer institutions about the nature of the course of the exam. And I always satisfy the people that are asking the questions. So because you want to transfer these courses smoothly, and because other institutions have dealt with online exams in this period too, a lot of schools have had to adjust 
what they say they accept or what they thought they were accepting. There are some famous schools that took no mathematics credit if the course was taught online. That changed during the pandemic. But just a quick run through the rules here. Consists of five problems. It, it was four or five problems, but I'll double check. You're going to submit it as a PDF document as you submit your homework to our assignments folder. Organize your document neatly. It will include multiple pages. Please number your pages and write your name on each page just so I keep track of things. If you've got the pages numbered 1 through 13 and there's only six pages present, well, then I'm going to probably get back to you and ask you if something's wrong. But if I just see six pages, I figure you submitted six pages. So numbering your pages is really in your best interest. Show all the work necessary to reach your answers and make sure you indicate your answers clearly. Don't approximate something unless it's specifically requested. And sometimes you need to approximate things. And I indicate that. This exam is to be completed entirely by yourself, which is a different rule than our homework. But you can use your book, you can use your notes, you can use any material from our website. You can use any calculator or computer algebra system to verify your calculations or create graphics. And you're going to need to create graphics, nice graphics with Mathematica. You may not share any of this exam or its questions with any other person or service. This is my copyrighted personal property that I am sharing with you. You may not discuss any part of this exam with anyone else until it's graded and returned to you. And if you have any questions about the exam, you're not consulting with each other, but please contact me because I can answer the question. Sometimes good questions come up and I'll share the responses with the whole group. So by all means, if you have a question about something as you're working on it, please contact me and I'll give you clarification. So you please sign this. This is page one of the exam. I don't have any other pages right here. This was just the title page of the exam. I just want you to know ahead of time what it's going to look like. I'm going to go back to my website now so I can show you where you'll find it. And we'll open this up. We're looking at our website now. So I, some of this is coming back to me, the dual monitors and stuff. So I'm trying to keep a monitor over here that shows me exactly what you're seeing as opposed to what I'm seeing. So we're here in Math 264. We're in week six. We're talking about the beginning of chapter three, which is linear systems. It's a lot of fun. Linear systems is something we can know exactly. And, and that's very refreshing. It's refreshing to you. It's refreshing to me. I mean, we enjoy the qualitative analysis. We enjoy the numerical approximations. But it's also nice to have a formula in our hands that we can test, graph, check. And for linear systems, for the entire chapter three, we can solve these exactly and analytically. We'll still benefit from the qualitative analysis and the numerical analysis, but we have exact analytic solutions that are possible here because of the principles of a linear system and the beauty of matrix arithmetic. So we're going to be doing this for three weeks. This is a major part of the course. It's a major part of the course because it forms a tool that you can use to analyze extremely complex systems. Linear systems are a little bit like a magnifying glass that you can hold up to any complicated system. So if you learn all the possibilities in a linear system, you will know how to treat just about any complicated system. You see that we're going to be working on this for three weeks until your spring break. We go in here to week six. So you see where you're going to find your exam. So typical week, three, one, three, two, three, three, lots of practice problems available to you that are really useful. Your list of the next homework, which will not be due February 23, but March 2. So March 2, we'll have problems from three, one, three, two, three, three, 
even three, four, which we'll discuss next week. But your exam will be listed right here. Under exam one, when it's completed, the solutions will be listed right here. Like solutions to homeworks are always posted after you complete them. And you can download the exam from here later tonight. Uh, worst case scenario, by 11.59 p.m. But I'll see if I can have it up a little bit earlier than that. I don't like to overlap while you're working on homework and have something else that you have to download or manage. But I know that a lot of you are conscientious about your homework. You're handing it in relatively early in the evening. You probably like to look at the exam early as well. I'll see if I can have it up by about 11. Okay, exam one covers chapters one and two, as we discussed, released here and due in the assignments folder by that time. So maybe I should give a small space for a question here just to make sure if there's anything procedural you'd like to ask. Is there anything you'd like to ask about that exam process? And you don't have to be formal or raise your hand or anything. You could just unmute and drop in, or you could go into the chat. Either way is fine with me. Okay. And we mentioned this, and we mentioned this, and you have your homework due tonight. We'll allow some homework questions in the seven o'clock hour tonight. Okay, let's get down to work then, because this is kind of fun. Like I said, I have a 16 page handout that I prepared to give to you tonight. Many of the pages in color, because they're useful in color. It's not a perfect handout, but it's on my website as well. It's going to look approximately like this, multiple pages, some of the pages in color because that illustrates things. And it goes on for some time because this covers everything we'll do for the next three weeks. This covers all of chapter three in this book. The book speaks for itself and I cannot improve on the book but sometimes it helps to summarize things. And so I like to summarize things. I summarize things in those pages. We're not gonna do everything in those 16 pages tonight. We might get to three or four or five pages, but you can download that and start reading it immediately. I'll show you where I have that available for download. Let's go back to website. Under We're on our week six page. We're looking at our handouts. Under first order linear systems. And on our resources page, under first order linear systems, you'll find all these handouts. I have the handouts available individually because sometimes people just download them one or two at a time. But I thought this was so useful. I packaged all 16 right here. So... This is the same handout that I just showed you physically, except the 16 pages are in order presented here. If you've got a color printer, then you can go for it in color. If you've got a black and white printer, you could print and then copy things in color as I presented them here. I could add more to these pictures but these pictures pretty much tell you the whole story and maybe you'll take notes on this as we go along next week and the week after anyway. Kind of fun in the last three pages of this booklet, I have just a batch of practice problems so that when we're done with this, you will be solving these systems, as I said, analytically and almost instantly, almost by sight, you cannot work out the formula necessarily instantly, but you can always have a plan and you can execute the plan quickly. 
So once you're presented with a matrix that represents a system, I'll show you how that works in a little while, you can quickly identify what kind of matrix it is, what its qualities are, and from there you can write down the general solution. So here's a bunch of practice problems. Here, with order switched, you know, so that you can't just like doing the crossword puzzle, turn the paper upside down and read the answers to the crossword puzzle. Here are the answers to all these questions, but I scrambled the order so you wouldn't be as tempted to look them up. It'll take you a second to identify where each problem is. And then here's another handout with the questions presented to you in another manner. And I don't have answers submitted for this. This is the last page in the handout. But by the time you get to this page, you'll understand what you should be doing. And you'll understand how you can check your work yourself. So you could most likely quickly fill in these answers yourself. But this is more practice classifying. That's page 16, 15, 14, and then all the way back to the beginning. Tonight, I'm going to start with this page right here. And... I do not like to read things to you, so I'm going to show you on a pad of paper under the camera, but I will frequently go back to this handout. So I don't think you're going to run and print this right now, but if you've got a few minutes at the first break, you might print the th first three or four pages just to have them handy. Okay. And I'm going to stop sharing there. So Again, this is presented right here. Week six, handouts, first order linear systems. These are the analogy to the first order linear equations we did in chapter one. I'm going to add more links here, but under our resources page where we collect all handouts, notice that. Let me reload. You might have to reload to get this linear systems link right here. But here under linear systems, I have all the handouts that I just showed you just about one at a time. I This last one called Families of Two-Dimensional Linear Systems, that was not in the booklet that I gave you. But all these others here are printed in the booklet that I gave you. So you can find these singly or all at once in this packet, as you wish. You click on one of these, you'll just get that page from the booklet, just that single page. Okay, good. Okay, thank you for your attention. Let's go and start doing some math now. I'm gonna cut back to the paper. So a first order linear equation I don't know what my lighting is exactly down here, but it looks reasonable. I've taken all the studio elements out of my basement after we went back to in-person meeting. First order linear equation was classified as first order, one derivative, linear, that means the derivative and the independent variable, the variable we're solving for y, only appeared to the first power. It was not mixed. It was not multiplied, squared, signed, cosigned, rooted, or anything else. And the complications came from the a of t and the b of t in the problem. We learned two methods for solving this. They were the method of undetermined coefficients and the method of the integrating factor. But now we're going to turn our attention to first order linear systems. Oh, by the way, I will also copy these notes that I'm writing on, and I will also post them 
as a link to the website if someone's checking out the recording or if someone needs to follow along with the audio later as long as everything is recorded nicely. I'm just checking the comments and I'm make sure I answer comments. Uh, if you reload the page, that may be an issue right there. So I just want to make sure you give me a heads up because the comment is not seeing this document. Week six, handouts. This is the link under first order linear systems, just the two words linear systems. This is the link that should take you to these 16 pages. And I just uploaded that link a few minutes ago. So you might have to force reload our website, whatever it is you do to make sure you're getting the latest version of our page. And then you should see it. If you still don't see it by the end of the night, let me know and we'll figure out another way to get to it. Okay, another report that it was under resources, but not under week six. That still sounds like a reload issue to me because I'm on the live version of week six right now. So as you're looking at this, this is our live week six page and it should be present, but one way or another, you get to it. And if you don't get to it by the next hour, let me know. Probably it's an issue that you have to reload the page. So let me tell you what a first order linear system is. A first order linear system is any system of this form, where I have the two independent variables, Okay, keep working on it if you need to find it. So I have X and Y dependent variables I'm solving for, T independent variable, time if you wish. And X and Y will depend on both X and Y. But only in a linear fashion, these A, B, C, and D here are constants. They are not functions of T. This is an autonomous system. The X depends on both X and Y. The Y depends on both X and Y. So this is not decoupled or partially decoupled. This is full engagement with the X and Y. But the coefficients of the X and Y are constants and the X's and Y's and their derivatives only appear to the first power. The beauty of this presentation, and let me morph this for you slowly, is that we can use our vector language. We pretend that X and Y are a vector, two-dimensional vector, such as you played with in previous courses. And the derivative of that two-dimensional vector depends on that vector itself multiplied by a constant. But the constant here is not a constant number. It's a constant two by two matrix. Let's look at this analogy to how quickly we solved this problem in the past. dy dt equals a y. And y of zero is why not? Remember, the solution to that was y of t equals y not e to the at. Here, a is a constant. This was the most valuable problem in ordinary differential equations. Well, now we're repeating that, but we're repeating it in matrix form. If you allow me to write y, yeah, and I got to do all kinds of paper shuffling issues too, right? I got to get used to shuffling my paper back under the camera. Sorry. 
If you allow me to write y as xy, the vector, if you allow me to write A as the matrix A, B, C, D, I'll remind you about matrices in a second, then instead of writing dy dt equals ay linear equation, I'm writing dy dt equals ay linear system. This is a linear system. This over here was the linear equation. And so the thing that makes you excited, oh, I could have initial conditions here too, like x at zero is x naught, y at zero is y naught. If you like, I could encode the initial conditions into a single vector. y at zero is x naught, y naught. Now, it's not quite two copies of this problem, right? Understand that, that I do have a complication. The complication is I have two independent variables. If this was fully decoupled, if I only had dx dt is ax and dy dt is dy, well, then that would be two copies of the most valuable problem in ODEs. That would be two copies of the MVP in ODEs. But I've got this interaction which complicates things. So the question is, how strong is this analogy between first order linear system and first order linear equation? First order, first order linear equation with constant coefficient was solved so sweetly. Can I solve these exactly the same way? Well, it doesn't sound reasonable that I could have an exponential matrix times t as I had exponential number times t. That's not inside your experience right now, but it could be. So there are people that write the system solution in this fashion. And this is one notation for first order linear system solution. but it's not as flexible or intuitive as I would like. So we're gonna follow the book's presentation and build up some of your skills with linear algebra. I'm also gonna watch my clock here. So what I need to do is remind you a little bit about what matrices is. We started doing that last time, but I wanna be more specific. And I want you to make sure that you understand that matrices is a very large subject. You should check out linear algebra class. You'd be welcome to do that and you'd benefit from it. But the difference between this class and linear algebra class is linear algebra class will deal with matrices in general, all matrices and all the things you could do with them. And that, re that uh, requires them to talk about four rows, 10 columns, any size matrix, a matrix is just a table of numbers. But our needs in this class, our needs in differential equation are such that we would be satisfied with only two by two matrices. So if you have experience already with two by two matrices, then you have a good head start. You say, well, how could we cover everything with just two by two matrices? Wait and see. That doesn't mean that in differential equations, you can't use larger matrices, but a great majority of the useful things you can do can be accomplished just with two by two matrices, just in two dimensional systems like this. And the evidence for that is the damped harmonic oscillator that we've already talked about. Damped harmonic oscillator can be presented in this case where the A is zero, the B is one, the C is minus K over M, and the D is minus B over M. If I can show you a mechanical way to solve all linear systems, then I've certainly showed you a mechanical way to solve all damped harmonic oscillators. So first we're gonna need some linear algebra chops. And 
And this is where the first three or four pages of that handout come in. If you've never done linear algebra before, let's not worry about it. It's always a debate among mathematicians. Should we teach linear algebra and differential equations at the same time? You would say 20 or 30 years ago that the prevailing view was that linear algebra was a servant of differential equations and that linear algebra should be presented first inside differential equations which is a little bit how we're going to do it. But linear algebra right now is so powerful that it's got a subject in its own right. And linear algebra organizes many, many things in mathematics, not just differential equations. Uh, the hottest topics right now for linear algebra are in data science and collection and analysis of large groups of data. So that's one of the best applications for linear algebra that I could mention right now. And if you're interested in such things, we have class like that. See Math 225, which is called Introduction to Data Science. Some of you are currently enrolled in the class Math 263, which is called Introduction to Linear Algebra. And if that's the case, then everything you're learning is going to be very useful to you in what we do. Really, the things you're learning will go past what we do. Although for a time, we might pass that in some of the topics because we only have to cover two by two matrices. If you're interested in either class, Math 225 or Math 223, you can see me. If you're interested in Math 263 explicitly, you understand a little bit how my website is organized. All you have to do is change the 264 to 263, and you'll see my Math 263 course right here. In particular, I have students working on Math 263 independently from a previous semester. So you find everything about linear algebra on this website, not just the things that we're doing that are specific to differential equations. Semesters 263, this was left over from a fall course. So dig in, enjoy yourself, and let me know if you have any questions. But before we do our first break, let me remind you about the basics of matrices and vectors. So you dealt most recently with vectors in the three-dimensional case. A vector is a position in space. You wrote them often like this. Some people write them with square brackets sideways. Some people write them with parentheses sideways. Some, you know, there's different varieties for people presenting these. Sometimes we'll have use for the old pointy bracket notation that's used in Calc 3. But really, when you present a vector like this as a column, this is among the most flexible ways to present a vector. As we said, we're only going to deal with two dimensional vectors in this class. But there's no reason that you can't have vectors that have 10 slots in them or any number of slots. So I could put an N here if I don't want to commit to having five or six or 10 dimensional vectors. I can use any dimension I please. I've already said to you that a matrix is just a table of numbers like 2, 3, 0, minus 1, 7, 14. This is a table, such as you'd read in a presentation or a paper. It has two rows and three columns. But in mathematics, we give this table additional special properties. This is called a 2 by 3 matrix. 
when you talk about a matrix, you always name the rows and then you name the columns. So there are two rows, and three columns. This is not a three by two matrix, it's a two by three matrix. But now that I'm here in my two by three matrix, I have the freedom to think about the rows as individual vectors or the columns as individual vectors. I could say that this matrix is composed of two three-dimensional row vectors, or I could say that this matrix is composed of three two-dimensional column vectors. Whatever suits my needs at that moment. But just think about this. A matrix is a way to code information. Now, you had a special operation in your, excuse me, I got to make sure everybody's recording. Good. You had a special operation called dot product in your most recent calculus class. You know, x comma y dot a comma b was you multiply the slots and you add them together. And this works for two-dimensional vectors. This works for three-dimensional vectors. One, two dotted with three, four is three plus eight. One times three, two times four, three plus eight, three plus eight is 11. But I could say minus one, two, zero, seven, one. I could have a five-dimensional vector dotted with a five-dimensional vector, three, zero, zero, five, 13. There's nothing wrong with having any dimension I care to use as long as they match. Now, it wouldn't make any sense if I taught you how to dot things and then gave you two things that were of different lengths. Well, then you're not really seriously dotting them. You might be able to do other things with them, but you're not dotting them. So when I dot these two vectors right here, I get minus three plus zero plus zero plus 35 plus 13. If I add that up carefully, 35 and 13 is 48. Minus three is 45. So dot product is not mysterious. You've already done that before. And even if I wrote the vectors like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, and told you to dot them, you would learn that game quickly. Four plus 10 plus 18. Four plus 10 is 14 plus 18 is 32. Even if I wrote the vectors like this, now pay attention, one and minus three as a row and two and seven as a column. Well, because they're the same size and because you've learned an operation called dot product, you'd say, oh, I, I especially if he says, do the dot product on these two vectors, you'd understand what I want you to do. One times two, first slot times first slot, minus three times seven, second slot times second slot, two minus 21 is minus 19. <clears throat> you learned other cool tricks when you were doing vectors like one, two, and minus three. And then if I dot that with uh, zero, six, and oh, four, notice if I dot two vectors, one, two, minus three, zero, six, four. If I dot two vectors and get zero, that had special meaning in our calculus class. The meaning when you dot two vectors and get zero is these two vectors were perpendicular to each other. They were separated by 90 degrees. We're gonna use that. In fact, in your calculus class, you were probably told that if you dot any two vectors of any size and you get zero, it means those two vectors are perpendicular. So you know how to identify perpendicular vectors in two-dimensional space, three-dimensional space, even 10-dimensional space. But now I'm gonna mix matrices and vectors. So if you allow me to say a matrix is just composed of vectors, either row vectors or column vectors, then you now know how to multiply matrices. If I take one, two, minus three, zero, seven, one, and I lay down another table next to it, like four, five, zero, one, zero, seven, 
These are not vectors anymore. They're combinations of vectors. These are legally two matrices. This matrix is two by three. This matrix is three by two. But by their sizes, I'm allowed to dot the rows and the columns. So if you already know this, you're going to forgive me, but I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. When you multiply matrices, all you do is dot each row with each column. So if I dot the first row with the first column, I get 14. 1 times 4, 2 times 5, minus 3 times 0. If I dot the first row with the second column, I get minus 20. If I dot the second row with the first column, I get 35. If I dot the second row with the last column, second column, I get seven. I'm not particularly fast at these, right? But the presence of the zeros helped me, right? Zero, seven, one dotted with one, zero, seven. Well, the only thing that wasn't zero, zero plus zero plus one times seven. Notice this about our work, that when we multiply a two by three matrix times a three by two matrix, the only reason we're even allowed to do that is because I have the right size rows striking the right sized columns. So if I had a row with three numbers and a column with seven numbers, there'd be no dot product possible. So by matrix multiplication, we understand that the number of columns in the first matrix must match the number of rows in the second. And then more bonus, because you have two rows and two columns, you can only execute four numbers. First row times first column is first number. First row, first column. First row times second column is the second number. First row, second column. The second row times the second column produces this number here in the second row and second column. So matrix multiplication, although to people at the beginning it looks mysterious, is not so mysterious as people first believe. The first time you see this, someone says, 35, where'd you get 35? Well, that just came from 071 dotted with 451. 0, 35, 0, added together is 35. Now, again, we're only going to do two-dimensional vectors and two-by-two two matrices in this class. But you need to know that you can multiply any size matrix times any other size matrix as long as you have this matching number of columns and number of rows. And the result is easily read by looking at the number of rows in the first and the number of columns in the second. You know how big your answer is going to be, two by two. So I'm not going to make bigger examples than this, but I do want you to take one thing away. All I'm doing is a dot product. That's all I'm doing is a dot product. Let's move to page three, and we'll take a break in a few minutes. So let's just practice a two by two times a two by one. This is going to be our most common application. And this is not a lot of calculations to perform. Let's say the two by two is three, seven, minus one, four. Let's say the two by one is minus three and one. Then I know the answer is legal. I know I'm allowed to multiply, and I even know that the answer is two by one. Because the answer is the number of rows here and the number of columns here. So now I multiply. I take three, seven dotted with minus three, one, and that's negative two. Minus nine plus seven. Then I take minus one times minus three, which is three. Three plus four is seven. If you can learn to do that much multiplication, then you know everything we need to do with matrices in this class. But I haven't shown you the superpowers of matrices. So let's think like this. Let's go back to our differential equation yet, at least the form of our differential equation. And remember from now on, when I write this, 
what I'm really writing is a vector equation. And I write this vector equation in this fashion because it just saves me some writing. Instead of saying A, B, C, D, I just get to say matrix A. But we're only going to use this equation in the two by two context. So we need a program for solving these. And so we need to investigate the superpowers of matrices. And that's what your handout is about. Let me introduce you to three simple things and we'll take a break. You can stretch your legs for five minutes. I'm going to stretch my legs, get a more comfortable chair, get a space heater, and we'll come back at five minutes later. Like you have a driver's license and your driver's license has individual characteristics about you your height, your hair color, your eye color, your address. You have to present your driver's license as a form of identification in many places. If a law enforcement officer pulls you over on the road, that's for your license and registration, right? Matrices have characteristics. Matrices have things, but they're not eye color, hair color, address, and weight. The two most important things about any square matrix are its trace and its determinant. In fact, whenever somebody hands you a matrix, the first two things you write down are its trace and its determinant. The trace of a matrix, a square matrix, any square matrix, is the sum of the elements on the main diagonal. The main diagonal of a square matrix is the diagonal that begins in the upper left and ends in the lower right. It's called the main diagonal. So the matrix above us, 3, 7, minus 1, 4, that has a trace of 7. 3 plus 4 is 7. I'll just use that as my example. For short, most people abbreviate trace with a capital T. Some people abbreviate it in other ways, but you can adjust. That depends on how the book is presented. This book uses capital T for trace. Determinant, you did use in Calc 3. It's the product of the main diagonal. Subtract the product of the off diagonal. You use this in cross products in Calculus 3. So determinant of A, B, C, D is A, D minus B, C. And people use capital D for that often. And this is 12 minus negative 7 is 19. Be very careful not to screw this up, as I screw this up all the time. But it's not 12 minus 7, 5. It's 12 minus negative 7. And the minus signs will catch you. And you will make mistakes on that often, but you're going to have to like just force them out of your work. Okay. So trace and determine this matrix seven and 19. Now, there are other cool things about matrices we want to know, and I could list several, but the next one that comes to mind is the characteristic equation. Every square matrix has its own characteristic equation. And remember, I'm only talking about square matrices right here. If the matrix was not a square matrix, if it was rectangular, if it was three by four, then it doesn't have a trace or a determinant properly. Although, as you go on and learn more things, 
you'll learn how to construct things that are analogous to trace and determinant, even for non-square matrices. So you could think like this. Every matrix that's not square secretly wants to be square. And in a way, we can make it happen for them. But that's not the subject in this class. I'm only going to talk about square matrices. And I'm only going to talk about two by two square matrices. So two by two square matrices, the characteristic equation is defined like this. Lambda squared minus trace times lambda plus determinant equals zero. This is called the characteristic equation of the two by two matrix. So this matrix right here, let's call it A, the characteristic equation of this matrix, since the trace is seven and the determinant is 19, the characteristic equation of this matrix is lambda squared minus seven lambdas plus 19. It's a quadratic equation and you are experts in quadratic equations. So in a sense, we're gonna solve this in a second, probably after the break. So write these things down. Whenever someone hands you a two by two matrix, these are the first things you write down. Trace determinant characteristic equation, which comes from the trace and determinant. I'm gonna show you how to use these when we come back from the break. So I want you to stretch your legs. Let's say we come back here at, by my clock, I have 7.01. I'm gonna mute my microphone and get up and move around. Let's come back at 7.07. .07. I am still recording. Hopefully I'm recording successfully. So I'm just gonna record over those five minutes and let people scrub over the video as they wish later. Take a break and relax for a few minutes.
Okay, welcome back. I hope you're not having PTSD from your previous pandemic experience. But this is better than nothing. So I'm going to move ahead and tell you what you can do with trace determinant characteristic equation in just a second. But I did say I'd allow for any questions you want to ask as you're working on your homework. I'll answer questions in email as I would ordinarily do, and I did have one or two questions in email. But if you have something here, I could give a snap example for, or a quick question for, I will entertain it here. Remember, we're recording. You don't have to come on the mic. You're welcome to. But you can also just type something into the chat. You can also drop files in the chat. So if you're asking a question about producing an image or something in Mathematica, if you want to see something produced, or let me look at what you tried to produce, you can leave a file in the chat as well. Is there something you'd like to ask or drop in the chat? That we could look at quickly. I see that question. I can show you an example that specifically what problem the question is about plotting the individual y and v curves and it can be done with parametric plot that's true but are you looking at a specific problem you'd like to see that you're trying to do that in let's look at two three four Okay, and Samia, okay, very good. So let's look at two, three, four alt quickly. And the question is about plotting the individual Y and V curves. And then the question is about uh, singling out the colors as I try to demonstrate once or twice in class. So let me, first of all, open up that problem, then I'll probably open up a Mathematica notebook. And I'll show everybody the problem and we'll spend some minutes on this. That's not a problem. So 2.34 alt, share that screen with everybody. Here's a second order equation. Can you use appropriate technology to sketch the direction field and the phase portrait of the associated first order system when you allow V to be dy dt. And then can you find two non-zero solutions that are not multiples of each other? That was the EST technique we described last time. And then for each solution, can you plot its solution curve in the YV plane and its YVT and V of T graphs? So this, can be done most easily with the first order systems notebook I have here. I do have a notebook called first order linear systems immediately above it. And you can use that on everything in chapter three as well. But let's just open up this first order systems notebook. I'll download it and we'll put that problem in there. We'll do a demo. So I'm just gonna get a clean version. Make sure I grab first order systems, not first order linear systems. Hey, excuse me, and download. And then after that, I'll open it up here. I'm going to put it on my desktop. I can also share my desktop instead of just sharing a window. But one thing at a time, I got to get all my skills back. So I'm gonna write this on a piece of paper here in case I wanna do some notes. 
I got my four y double prime plus nine y primes plus two y's is zero. And no initial conditions on this at all. And that was a note that someone made. I'm going to go back to my paper screen right here. If we make the substitution y equals est right here, and y prime and y double prime, s and s squared, est, then once we substitute these in and collect the terms, I have est is 0 times est times s squared, 4 plus s, 9, plus 2. Did I read that correctly on that problem? It says 2. That's a quadratic equation. In fact, not unlike we're going to do with our matrices. The thing that makes me uncomfortable about this quadratic equation is I don't see any cheap way for me to factor this. So I'm going to pull out the quadratic formula. Opposite of b plus or minus b squared minus 4 times a times c. No. Oh. Who knows? Maybe it does factor nicely. Divided by 2 times a. It's always unwise to be in a rush. So we're just double checking. Opposite of b, b squared. 4 times 4 times 2. Subtract 4 times 4 times 2. So I have minus 9 plus or minus 81 minus 32 is 49 rooted over eight. So this gives me two S's. Negative nine plus seven is negative two over eight, negative one fourth. And negative nine minus seven is negative 16 over eight, which is negative two. This is just preliminary work you've probably done. And this gives me two solutions, minus one four T, and minus 2t. I do this so that I recognize what I get in Mathematica in a second is what I expect. Uh, notice, by the way, these clean answers, this nice root right here. I guess that was a signal that that thing could have factored. I shouldn't have been spooked by that thing so easily. It must have factored into 4s plus 1. And... Uh, s plus 2. Is that correct? 4s squared plus s plus 9s plus 2. Yes. So don't give up on factoring, but always remember the quadratic equation can serve you. Now, I'm just going to keep going. The velocity is minus 1 quarter, e minus 1 quarter t, and the velocity of the second one is minus 2, e minus 2t. Two and I think I'm willing now to go to Mathematica and plug these things in because I have all the data here for this problem. I'm just labeling my sheets as I go. So let's hop over to Mathematica. We'll come back here if we need to look up a number. So I'm going to open first order systems right here. I'm going to share this with you. I'm still just sharing windows. I don't want to share screen yet because I don't comfortable I'm doing everything correctly. Uh, I'm going to pump up the word size here. But I learned during the pandemic that doesn't always work well because the screen resizes automatically. Uh, let's try that. Okay, good. Now I've got my x prime is f of x, y, g, uh, y prime is g of x, y, dx, dt is f of x, y, dy, dt is g of x, y. So this is set up so that I could put in these equations. Oh, I guess I did the one thing I didn't do yet from my paper. I never converted this to a first order system. You know, mass. B, K, 
M is four, P is nine, K is two, the MY double prime plus BY prime plus KY is quickly done, is the same as YV equals zero one minus K over M minus B over M. I did that with the substitution V equals dy dt, or V equals y prime. But frankly, you do this so often that you just remember that this matrix belongs to this system. So what I want to do is that if I multiply this out, that'd be saying x prime is, I'm sorry, y prime is V, and V prime is minus K over M Y minus B over M V. That's what I want to take my F and my G to the Mathematica page. So now let's go back there. Now, another thing I'm faced with right here is notice how I'm using X's and Y's for my dependent variables. I am not going to change that. So now you're going to have to adjust. The X will play the role of Y and the Y will play the role of V. So this should be written as X prime equals Y and Y prime equals minus K over M. The minus K over M was minus one half X minus B over M, minus B over M is minus nine over four, Y. I apologize for that, but I've already changed the letters. Now this is a recording, maybe you can go through it and help yourself adjust. I'll go back to the paper and write that later. Now I'm looking for solutions in the phase plane. Remember, my X here is the Y in the problem. My Y here is the V in the problem. I think I'm going to go with these solutions just as they are right now. But I will check and see what kind of graphics I have. And this will solve the coloring problem. That's right. I have this field just like this with these colored arrows. Streamlines. I don't have any streamlines in here yet minus three and two. Oh, I do have one solution right here that's buried in this field. It's a solution that goes through minus three and two. Now, the problem is you can't see it because I have the field there. So I'm going to comment out the field. There's a solution that goes through minus three and two. Let's handle the coloring problem right now. So the way I could color this that obviously didn't show up as red what I have to do is override Mathematica's coloring. So I have to say stream color function, none. And then I have to say stream style. Light gray. That would be one way I could do this. Now, that red should show up as red and any other arrows besides the one I'm singling out should show up in light gray. So for example, if I put automatic here, let's test it. That's what we want to see. So that may be answering one question. But I can add many, many solutions through here. Now, another person in a question said, I didn't give any initial conditions. Well, that's true. But let me show you the way around that. Now, before I do that, I'm also going to do the same adjustments to the field. Except here, it's going to be vector color function. Vector color function is none. And vector style is light gray. Then I can dump this vector scale and vector points here. Vector point says how many vectors, 14 by 14 grid right here. You can do more or less grid if you like, but I don't need these right now, so I'm going to get rid of them. 
I thought I was getting rid of them. I need to get rid of that comma. Now let's uncomment the field, but let me comment the streamlines. Okay, now I get this field that's not so distracting with the color. In fact, I can put that field and the streamlines together. But now it's too distracting because I got the streamlines and the field. What if I cut out the gray streamlines and just use that red solution on the gray field? That would look nice. Let me comment out the automatic. By the way, I'm commenting out here under, uh, I think I'd have to show screen to do that. That's right. So let me share whole screen with you. Now I'm sharing my whole screen. Under the Mathematica file, edit, comment selection and uncomment selection. I have a keyboard shortcut on my Mac, which is uh, command slash. I'm gonna go back to the window, stop sharing screen. So it's not hard for me to comment and uncomment things out, probably control slash on a PC. So now I'm gonna comment this thing out and watch this. Now I see the solution on the field. Now, my favorite is the solution on the streamlines because sometimes these field arrows can be deceiving. Like some of them look like they're standing on each other, like the up arrows, the down arrows. These are true readings, but the field arrows are very coarse. So if it was my case, I would leave this under automatic and not use the field unless I had to. Now. Let's go back to the paper and handle the question that was from the audience previously about no initial conditions. Actually, I have initial conditions right here. Remember, my Y1, V1 combination is E minus quarter T and minus quarter E minus quarter T. So my Y1 at zero is one and my y2 at zero sorry my v1 at zero is minus one quarter likewise my y2 v2 which was minus sorry plus e minus 2t and then minus 2e minus 2t that gives me initial conditions of y2 of zero is one and v2 of zero is minus two. So these are initial conditions I can feed to the machine. Let me do that. So I'm gonna add some initial conditions here, like the ones I'm interested in, which is one and minus one quarter. And if you want some variety, I will do the other one in blue and I'll make it one and minus two. These are the two base solutions, Y1 in red, Y2 in blue. And as I continue down this notebook, that's what I can use to do these initial conditions right here. So my initial conditions, let's try the one and the minus one quarter. One and minus one quarter here. Remember, I've already switched from Y's and V's to X's and Y's. So I apologize for that, but I'm not going to mod this notebook in front of you right now. But let's plot this initial condition. This is initial condition of one. The Y is in black and the minus one quarter is the V1 in blue. It is not remarkable because it's just exponential decay. And I've got a pretty big range right here, right? Might look prettier if I just went uh, minus 1.5 to 1.5. But that doesn't look terribly remarkable either. What if I carry this out to 15? Oh, that's pretty nasty. Check that out. Notice 
I went out to 15 in my solutions. And this is no longer exponential decay. Professor, um, we can't see your screen. Oh, good. Thank you. That is my fault. Uh, I like to hear myself talk too much. Let me go back to screen. Okay. Here we go. Back to the top. You believe the part about the initial conditions, one and minus one quarter, one and minus two. Okay, if you got that on your paper, now let's go back to the Mathematica notebook. I can put the one and minus one quarter in red and the one and minus two in blue. Then I can execute and see those two solutions. They're called straight line solutions become they, because they come in a straight line. But notice I can also put the one and minus one quarter in here and have numerical differential equation solver, have Mathematica do a numerical solution like this, blue and black. This does not look encouraging because this does not look like exponential decay. But the problem was I only let the numerical differential equations solver work for five seconds, and I'm trying to graph 15 seconds here. Let's let the solver work for 15 seconds. There, that's exponential growth and decay. Uh, there's a little prettier window. Let's put the other initial conditions in here, one and minus two. Now I'm going to have to adjust my window again. Let's make this minus 2.5, 1.5. There's exponential decay. Very quick, e to the minus 2 is, right? So I'm not going to run this for 15 seconds. Even 5 seconds, it's already gone to 0. So this might help you when your question was, how do I graph these things individually? In this plane and as separate y of t and v of t answers. We did this for you on the board last week, but here's how you could make the machine do it in front of you. This section of this notebook, I could actually, and I'm gonna take the stream points from above, I could actually do two of them at once here. Stream points from above, got it, go. Let's try this. I've got too many things going on right here. Face plane, streamlines, cut. There, this is the solution side by side with, oh, this is the initial conditions of minus three and two. Let's do the initial conditions of one and minus two. as I did up here. There, this is the initial condition of one and minus two that corresponds to this blue solution. Now the black is the Y component of the blue solution. The blue is the V component of the blue solution. This is not better or worse than what I did above. It's just has the benefit of being side by side. But notice I have to manually adjust these windows. Also notice that it's kind of fuzzing out over here past four seconds because let somebody in the class. Good evening. We're just hanging out and doing differential equations. Uh, I had the numerical differential equation solver only working for the first 2.5 seconds. So I have to actually tell Mathematica to solve longer if I want it to solve longer then it does a better job of solving this expression here. If you're just joining us, this session is being recorded. I think I'm recording it correctly. I hope I am. So I'll post the whole recording later tonight so that no one misses anything. Let me pop out of here and just check the chat to make sure that I'm kind of making people happy. Uh, how about the fixing colors. Did that satisfy the question about fixing colors?
And then the other question was about individual Y and V plots. Did that satisfy the question about individual Y and V plots? Okay, very good. Now here's another question regarding 255. Let's look quickly at 255, show face plane plot. Let's look at the question. Maybe we'll work up a quick demo and then we can go on back to other things. So always just pop in and knock me over the head if I'm not showing you the proper screen. But let me open up 255 so everybody sees it. 255 looks like this. I'm trying to make that larger. Euler's method in an Excel spreadsheet to plot an approximation of this solution for the system with this initial condition over this time period. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we're going to do this in Excel spreadsheet, but you can do this in the same worksheet we were just working on if you want to work yourself up a phase portrait. So sine y, 2x minus x cubed minus y. I might as well just be curious. And I'm going to have to go to another window again. I understand. What if I had put sine y in here? Remember, capital sign in Mathematica. And it was 2x minus x raised to the 3 minus y. If I'm counting that problem correctly, yes, I am. And we were interested in 1 and minus 3. So sine y is in there. Got it. Let's look at 1 and minus 3. Remember, this is going to be my first shot at this. If the graphics don't look good, we'll fix them. But let's just see what we got. Okay, it's an interesting looking system. Uh, 1 and minus 3 is about right here, where my arrow is. And it looks like I'm heading in here to the center. I'm bouncing off and then possibly heading into a spiral. I see all solutions right here. Remember, these are numerical approximations. So I haven't confirmed that this is exactly what things look like. But this looks like a fairly nice picture, a pattern of two spirals, left and right. And then in the center, a place where I am bouncing off the origin almost. That's maybe the best word I can use right there. Uh, is my picture too big? Is my picture too small? Well, that depends on what I can get out of these two equations. Remember, I want to know the equilibrium points. Sine y is equal to zero many, many times. And 2x minus x cubed minus y is equal to zero several times. Maybe the easiest way to know that. Bounce over to Desmos right here. Remember, Desmos has got this, like, I don't know how to deal with the way I name things, right? So I'm going to say y equals... I'm sorry, 2x minus x raised to the 3 minus y equals 0. Too many equals. There we go. And then I have sine of y equals 0. Sorry. Too many letters. Why am I doing that? Okay, that's better. 
And now I'm going to uh, scrunch this up on the axis, minus 20 and 20. Now remember, this right here is dy dt. And this right here is dx dt. So your first responsibility is to search for equilibrium points. Those are places where dx dt and dy dt are both zero. dx dt was sine y, dy dt was 2x minus xq minus y. So where are both of these animals zero? Where they intersect. And I can see that there are infinitely many places that these two animals intersect. But my Mathematica portrait, I was just looking like minus four to four, minus four to four. I was only seeing this area right in here. That's fair because my initial condition was that, what was it, one and minus three? So I want to see what happens to a boat that starts right there. Let's go back to my Mathematica. So now I kind of see why I have those two things there. And if I had gone drastically bigger on my Y range, I don't know if this will going to break anything, but let's do minus 40 to 40 on the Y range. Like I did minus 20 to 20 in Desmos. Uh, that did kind of break things, didn't it? So... Let's not get out of control. How about let's try 20 and 20. We can only experiment. I think I'm going to either comment out these grid lines or dump them. Okay, still this is too much craziness for me to understand in this picture. So I'm going to try to go down minus 10 to 10. But I want to tell you, there must be a lot of equilibrium points, right? Because there's a lot of places where those two things intersect. And I think I see my equilibrium points at minus one, zero, 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 and zero, one. But I also see hints of equilibrium points up here. Maybe it would serve me to write the field in. and comment out the streamlines. Yeah, I do see kind of see my swirling in here at minus one, zero, 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 and one, zero, but I also see swirling up here, swirling down here. So as I continue that, let me try 20 again. I think I would see pockets of swirling that match what I saw in Desmos. Yeah, I, I see the swirling here. I see pocket of swirling here and here, here and here and here. I see three places of swirling. It's kind of like watching the cubic equation right here, causing disruptions in the flow of the sine field. I didn't say Seinfeld, I said sine field. See, this cubic equation right here is crossing at this horizontal line, but it's also crossing at every horizontal line above it and below it. Well, let's go back to the equation, the problem. Uh, where's the problem? Here's the problem. I'm supposed to use Euler's method to approximate a solution starting at minus one and three. I only got out the Mathematica, because I wanted to see how things work in that general area. So I'm going to go back to four and four. 
minus four to four, minus four to four. But I'll do a spreadsheet for you. Okay, and I'm going to bring the light red thing. Yes, by uncommenting the streamlines and recommenting the field. Okay. Now remember, this is only an approximation and Excel will only be an approximation. So I shouldn't believe that either one is necessarily the truth, but this looks reasonable. Does I get such a sharp bend? And does it continue? Well, it probably continues if I gave it more time to continue. But the machine kind of loses strength for estimating in here. You know, the machine can't estimate forever. Interesting if I could estimate here. I don't know if I can get anything out of that, but maybe I'll come back to it and check it later. So let's open up an Excel spreadsheet. It's kind of fun. Let me open up an Excel spreadsheet and I'll share it with you. Oh, and, and by the way, I have several Excel spreadsheets already on the website that you could use, but I might regret this. Let's just do one by scratch and see what happens. So we'll share an Excel spreadsheet and we'll fill in why we're looking at this problem. So you're only seeing one window on the screen, but I've got a whole mess of garbage here. Let's fill this in. Each step will be called K, and then there'll be a TK, an XK, a YK, and then the two functions, F of TKYK. This is not a wrong thing to do with our time right now, because you can imagine you're gonna do this on an exam. I'm just doing column headers. I'm not writing formulas right now. Then there'll be a delta T, dt, dx, and dy. So these will be my column headers. I'm going to lock that top row so that I can move up and down here without disturbing the top row. I'm going to make the top row bold and centered so I can look at it. It's still kind of too small from your perspective. But now I'm going to fill in. The initial value at k equals 0 was that time 0, x was 1, and y was minus 3. I'm going to make these people centered too. And these numbers should be up here. OK, better. Did I make people centered? Doesn't look like it. Now they're centered. Uh, F of T, K, Y, K should be sine of Y, should be the sine of D2. Now, I'm going to have to check how math, uh, Excel deals with radians, right? So if I say to Excel, sine of pi over 2, and I have to say sine of pi like that, capital P-I in Excel, and with open braces, with open parentheses, because I'm calling a function called pi in Excel. And what is sine of pi over 2? Uh, ordinarily, sine of pi over 2 is 1. So Excel is thinking in radians. OK, I'm happy with that. So I can say to Excel equals sine of this cell. I think I should be able to get away with that. Let's see what happens. Now, the G is going to be 2 times x minus x cubed minus y. So I'm going to have to write that as 2 times this cell minus, oops, sorry, try again, equals 2 times this cell 
minus this cell again cubed minus the y cell. I think that'll do it. Now that is one minus one, I'm sorry, two minus one minus negative three is four. So numerically that sounds right. Let's set our dt at 0 0.1 and then dx will be f times dt and dy will be equals g times dt. Okay, good. Now what I'm gonna do to make this nicer is get everybody the right number of decimals so I can concentrate. Let's give everybody four decimal places. That should be sufficient. And now what I have to do is write down the formulas to go to the next line, then I can drag and drop. So this cell under K will be equal to the cell above plus one. I'm gonna center these people. This cell TK is gonna be equal to the cell above plus the DT. This cell is gonna be equal to the cell above plus DX. This cell is gonna be equal to the cell above plus dy. I think I'm feeling okay. And then this cell is gonna be equal to the same formula that's in this cell. So I think I could pull this down. I think I could pull this down. This is gonna be equal to whatever's above because I'm gonna keep that constant. And these formulas are already set, so I think I can pull them down. Remember, we're only spitballing here, right, until we try to draw it. But we have one thing in our favor for Mathematica. We know approximately what the solution looks like. So now I think I'm ready to pull down. Let's give me some 20 or 30 spaces right here. So this is going for zero seconds to 3.6 seconds. Here's my X and Y. That's what I want to graph. Let's insert a chart with XK and YK. I highlight those. I want to insert a chart. Oh, what kind of chart? Line chart might be okay. And that does not look like I want it to look. Sorry. So let's go back and see what's going on here. XKYK, I don't want to involve the TK, I want to plot X and Y. And it's plotting them as one series here. Okay, this might be, I have to go back to my other worksheet and remind myself how I did this. But I should be able to highlight these two. And then I should be able to insert chart not lines, maybe scatter plot. That's what I want. Sorry. Okay. This could be better. But I don't want just the YKs. But now I'm going to go back to my Mathematica notebook to see what I'm looking for. Nope, wrong one. Sorry. Mathematica notebook, where are you? So I want something that looks approximately like this, minus four to four, minus four to four. So let's go back to our Excel notebook and set this axis, format the axis, minus four to four. Got it. Let's set. Why am I not showing X and Y? 
So I'm not formatting the vertical axis. Let me go to select data. So I want an XK and a YK. So my XK is gonna be called on this sheet right here. My X values are gonna be from here. It would have been safer, I guess, if I would have used one of my pre-made sheets. My Y values are gonna be there. That looks good. I don't want two series. I don't think I want two series. And there I go, I'm getting into trouble. Hmm, I've got my axes at least, so I can go minus four to four on this axes. Ah, uh, you know what? I don't think we're doing too bad. Let me resize this. Let's look at the positive parts. It begins at one minus three, although it's hard for you to see that. So let me get my labels and numbers readable. I don't need four decimal places. And I don't need four decimal places here. This is going to pay off, so be patient. I don't need four decimal places there either. I learned Excel, unfortunately, just by hunting around. I'm going to make this 12. I'm going to make this 12. I could put those numbers on the outside. So let's put axes, options, labels, next axes, low, next axes, low. Okay, now I got a window I can look at. Do you know what this looks like? It almost looks like my answer, except it's bent the wrong way. This is gonna be a really instructive moment. So watch this. Let's go back to our Mathematica. Look at this sensitive system. Do you know that if I bounce the wrong way off that origin, I might fly over here to the right? But I'm thinking I should fly over here to the left. So what should I do? Possibly I should course correct more quickly. So let's do, back to the Excel spreadsheet, let's do some extreme course corrections. Let's make my DT equal to 0 0.05. Now, notice I'm still zooming in on the origin, but how am I gonna see if I bounce off the right way? I'm gonna have to continue this thing massively downwards. So, Let's see what I got, 350 things, seconds right there. Now I'm gonna get back to my picture. I'm going to pull down both of these and this cost me a little time, but yeah, it's gonna be worth it. Here's a problem with a numerical approximation. It's sensitive to the initial conditions. Look at that. This is beautiful. We should get paid to do this. Do you see what happened? That zero, zero was a place of cutting solutions either left or right. And now that I've done this fine DT, I bounced off to the right as Mathematica said that I should. So Mathematica did a little bit better numerical approximation than I did in Excel. But now let's talk about what Excel excelled at. 
Excel allowed me to continue this approximation to zero in on the equilibrium point, wherever that is. I said earlier, minus one, zero, 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 one, zero. Somehow I think this looks more like root two here. You go back to your equations and check this out. So let's go back to my Excel. I like this. Now, the only thing I don't necessarily like right here, okay, skip the title. I'll add title later. But so many dots. Let me take this data series and let's get rid of these dot markers. Marker, marker options, none. I, but I do want to color it by lines. I want to connect the lines. Mm, so I don't see what I'm doing there. Data, chart, design. I'm worrying too much about how this looks. Let me go back and put in the marker, oh, where did I put my markers? I hope I didn't erase them. I should not have erased them. Let's do format data series, format plot area, select data. Looks like possibly we erased them. No, they're right there. So, Format data. I think the problem is, yeah, okay, I turned them off so I didn't see them. Sorry about that. Format data series. Markers. I better turn them on before I break something. Okay, I'm going to let you work from here, but see here are the approximations following Euler's method. I would like those markers to be smaller, but I don't want to break these again. Fill border, smooth, connect, fill. I guess I could make them size smaller. Built in to Okay, yeah, now I'm just playing. But do you see how I get this curl around what could be maybe square root of two? This is a good picture. But do you see if I just change this to 0 0.06? I bounce the wrong way. Or maybe this is the right way. See, this is the problem with a numerical approximation. Both of these wiggles make sense. But how do I know, based on the accuracy I'm working with, which wiggle makes more sense? I guess I could increase the accuracy there, right? Zero, zero, four, zero, three. You know what I like about this picture with the zero, zero, three? Let me blow this up. I like that I see myself bouncing off the origin right there to the left. Of course, every time I increase this, zero, two, I get less number of dots in my picture, so I have to pull down more. So let's make a compromise, zero, three, five. I don't know. You might have been safer and faster if you'd used the sheets I provided, but I did want to show you how to do it from scratch. Let's go back to the problem. Sorry for using up this hour, but this is not bad because you're going to need to know how to do this. We're going to take a break in a second. Okay, so the problem was, let me go back to sharing this and we'll take a break. The problem was use Euler's method in Excel spreadsheet to plot an accurate approximation of the solution of the following system 10 seconds. 
maybe I didn't reach 10 seconds. I don't know. I'd have to go back and check. But I think we gave you an idea of how to create this Excel spreadsheet. Uh, let me see. Uh, the question is, do you want the table and the graph or just the graph? I think this table requested a lot of lines. So I'm going to go back to my thing without sharing it with you. I've got hundreds of lines here and I am up to 12 seconds. I reached 10 seconds at line 288. So to answer the question, I don't want 288 lines of table. Now, what you could do in a situation like this, if you were trying to communicate to someone, you could give people the first 10 lines of the table and the last 10 lines of the table. And I don't think that'd be crazy. But I do want the picture. And it wouldn't hurt to give me either the first 10 lines or the last 10 lines of the table just so I can check your numbers, kind of spot check if something's wrong. Yeah, but but you know what you'd be doing. So the best answer to that question is more like, well, if you, you were producing this as a product for someone, you'd be handing them the Excel workbook, right? But don't hand in the Excel workbook for me. Just give me the graphic. Give me 10 lines off the table if you can, just so I can spot check your numbers. Make sure you got your formulas generating the right thing. If you've got the first 10 lines right, you've got all the rest of the lines right if you pull down properly. Uh, that's a good question. So thank you. I, I think in the field, I think in the workplace, you'd probably be handing them the entire Excel workbook, which you would be proud to do. Okay. Very good question. So I'm going to stop sharing this. And uh, is that better? Excel is a powerful tool. Excel is a really powerful tool. We're going to go back to matrices, but we're going to take a break first. Thank you for being patient in this unorthodox format. Right now I have 805. Let's say we come back at 8.11, and then we'll work to our normal time. But I want to say more about the cool things you can do with matrices and say as much as we need. I think it was good to do that problem because I want you to give me some good Excel graphics and good Mathematica graphics on your exam. I want you to put some thought and care into those graphics. So as long as I'm recording properly, maybe this would be good documentation for you. And I think I am recording properly. Okay, you take five, I'll take five. I'll see you in a few minutes.
Okay, team, we're back. Um, I will find a way to post these notes, although they're kind of ragged. I will upload this video to YouTube and then send you a link later tonight. Then I got to post the exam too. So we'll get all that done while you're polishing your other stuff. Uh, I know that previously, go back to my web page. Oh, let me make one note about this before we leave here. You understand when someone says identify the equilibrium points, they want all the equilibrium points, right? Now, that's not what this problem said necessarily, but I think there was another problem where you would do something like this. So dx dt is zero at all these blue lines because those are the places where y is versions of pi. And dy dt was zero on this cubic curve. So the places where dx dt and dy dt were simultaneously zero are the intersections of the red cubic curve and the blue lines. So there are infinitely many equilibrium points in this problem. Equilibrium points is when both dx dt and dy dt are zero. No motion, no change. But we were only interested in portraying a solution that started at minus one, three here, where the black X is. So I didn't, uh, I'd have to go back and read the problem, but I don't think they asked for you to identify all the equilibrium points, but you'd know how you have to do that. Um, what else am I looking at right here? Uh, I do remember I have lots of videos, so I got to figure out where I'll put this video but I have a lot of videos posted and let's take a basic fixing problem and set up. Let's turn that off. And in the whole pandemic space, what we had was just the YouTube channel that had all kinds of videos. Basketball is back. And they're monetizing my videos. So these are all the videos that I link to from my website anyway, right? They're called my Math 264 videos. I'm not sure where I'll put the recording of this lecture, but, um, you know, likely in here somewhere, right? Where is my screen? Okay, good. So I'll find some place to put that video and link to it. I don't mind making small videos. I don't think I make videos better than anyone else makes videos. So that's why I don't make lots and lots of videos, just little short things like this. There are places where you get, I'm sure, much better differential equations videos than these. Okay, but uh, trigonometry and such. So let's leave here. And let's go back to maybe our website. Take a view of where we are. Now, right now, I'll pump this up. We're still discussing what matrices can do for us, which is really the content of what's going to happen in these three sections. And you understand that earlier in response to one of the earlier questions, I showed you the red and blue straight line solutions that were made from the EST technique and such. But I want to show you how to make those straight line solutions from the matrix technique. Because this is gonna let us automate our phase portraits, work them out much, much faster. But before I can do that, we're still kind of discussing how I can exploit vector and matrix notation right here. 
So it's an unusual evening. We'll get done what we can get done. But I still want to describe how I can use matrices and what I'm going to need to use matrices for. And that'll set you up to do all these things that we'll do as necessary. So let's go back to the paper and figure out where we were. This page of notes, we were just looking at that one particular problem. Two, four, I think it was. But before we did that, after we took our first break, we were looking at the superpowers of matrices. So trace, determinant, characteristic equation. Let me go back and show you exactly what I could do with those that would be more impressive. So I'm going to take a particular uh, matrix example, and I'm going to run through these things. And I want to show you one other thing on that booklet of notes that I drew your attention to. Back to my website for a second. Back to my handouts, linear systems, the booklet of notes that I'm directing your attention to. I'll give you a paper copy of that next week. But you can print out your own or use this this week as you wish. You must spend most of your time on your exam, most likely. So the first page of this booklet is saying what I already wrote on paper a second ago. Scan this page with me. A first order linear system with constant coefficients is a system of this form. A, B, C, D are constants. And we prefer to write it in the vector notation because it's a little more compact. And it's gonna allow us to automate some calculations. But we need to fully understand what we can do with a matrix first. So these are, the things we were saying. A matrix A, B, C, D, here are some key concepts you have to know. Trace, determinant, characteristic polynomial, characteristic equation. And then after that, there's a quadratic polynomial, right? It's got to have answers. In fact, you're experts at solving quadratic polynomials. The two solutions of the characteristic equation are called the eigenvalues of A. Very, very important values. Eigenvalues from the German, which was eigenwert, which meant unique value or unique worth. So the two solutions in this character's equation have a unique worth to us. And I'll show you how that works. So let's go back to the paper. And I'm just going to pick out a sample matrix. Three, four, five. We'll know how many pages we end with soon enough. So I'm going to create a system, y prime equals. And I'm going to create a sample A. This sample A is from that notebook or that little booklet of notes I gave you times Y. Remember, this is just a shorthand for dx dt is 2x plus 4y. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to go back to writing on the paper. I'm back to writing on the paper. I'm taking this matrix from that booklet I gave you. Remember, this is a shorthand for writing dx dt is 2x plus 4y, and dy dt is x minus y, 1x minus 1y. But I'm uniquely interested in this matrix, 2, 4, 1, minus 1. So I write down its trace. I write down its determinant, and I write down its characteristic equation. The trace is 2 plus negative 1, which is 
one. The determinant is negative two subtract four, which is negative six. You gotta get those straight. Make sure you don't screw up a sign there, which I often screw up my signs. The characteristic equation is lambda squared minus trace times lambda plus determinant equals zero. That's the characteristic equation. It's a trace. This is the determinant. And uh, you might be wondering why I don't use X's in here, why I use the Greek letter lambda. So minus trace is minus one lambda minus six plus determinant is minus six equals zero. And the reason we use lambda here is just tradition. Tradition in linear algebra that we signify the eigenvalues, the answers to this equation with the Greek letter lambda. You can use any letter you like. So I can factor this. And I see that it factors into lambda minus three and lambda plus two. But even if I can't factor a quadratic equation, I know that I always have two solutions. I can use a quadratic formula. Sometimes the solutions can be complex numbers. You might be wondering what we're going to do for that. But let's make no mistake, every quadratic equation has two answers. Sometimes the answer is repeated, like lambda minus three, lambda minus three. We'll deal with that too. But I have two eigenvalues, lambda two, lambda one, lambda two, I'll call them three and minus two. I just call them one and two to keep them separate from each other. These are the eigenvalues in German. Eigenwert, unique value, unique worth. So why are they uniquely valuable to us? Well, I'm looking at page two on your booklet. And page two on your booklet goes like this. You know how to scale vectors. You know that three times one, two is three, six. That's called scaling. You know how to multiply matrix times vector. After tonight, you know that two, four, one minus one times one, two is Oh, let me run my math here. Two plus eight is 10. One minus two is negative one. But what I notice about the matrix multiplication is I get this answer of 10 and minus one, which looks unrelated to the one and two. Like, how is that related? The first time you show someone this, they say, where'd you get 10 and minus one until you explain how you dotted rows times columns? On the other hand, you don't have to explain anything to someone when you teach them how to scale. Three times one, two is three, six. They see immediately what's happening. So we think that scaling a vector is easier than matrix multiplication. That's our intuition. But is it so? What if there are vectors where the matrix acts like scaling? Again, three times one, two is clearly three, six. How about three times four, one? Three times four, one is 12 and three, right? Check out this matrix times four, one. When I do this matrix A times four, one, what do I get? Eight plus four is 12. 
one minus one dotted with four one. Four minus one is three. Notice how I got the same answer. Notice how the matrix multiplication acted like scaling. I don't expect this to happen in general. If I just pick a matrix and a vector out of the air, matrix times vector is not often scaling it. But when a matrix does act like a scalar, this must be special. So here the matrix multiplication acted like scalar multiplication. So let's explore that in vector language. So I call my vector V, let's say vector V, I use the vector notation from calculus is four one. Matrix A is two, four, one minus one. I use a capital A, so I don't have to rewrite those numbers all the time. But I just noticed that A times V was the same as three times V. This is a matrix multiplication acting like scalar multiplication. But I also notice that it doesn't always work that way. Here, A times W was not three times W. In fact, it wasn't anything times W. There's no scaling of one, two that turns into 10 minus one. But the thing I notice about this equation where the matrix multiplication acted like scalar multiplication is that is not just any old number. That is one of my eigenvalues. So maybe this magic only happens when I scale with an eigenvalue. Let's think about this and let's solve some equation, vector equation like this. And I'll count on the fact that you know how to solve two by two equations generally, but we'll remind you as we go along. So what would it take for AV to be equal to lambda V? Let's just speak about any, any eigenvalue. This is three as an example. Well, let's think about it like this. It would be like saying the identity matrix times V, that's always equal to V. And lambda times the identity matrix would be something like lambda, lambda, zero, zero. When I say I right there, I'm talking about a special matrix called the two by two identity matrix. When you multiply this identity matrix, one on the main diagonal, zeros everywhere else. When you multiply the identity matrix times any other vector, you always get the vector in return. It's like multiplying by one. In fact, the identity matrix is like the one of matrix land, except in numbers, there's only one one, but in matrices, there are two by two identities, three by three identities, 10 by 10 identities. Identities can come in any square size. So lambda times I is a scaling of the identity matrix. And I want to know when AV is lambda IV. Well, I'm gonna use algebra skills here right now. I'm gonna subtract lambda IV from both sides, and that will give me zero. Of course, zero is the zero vector here, the vector that's zero in both slots. But I'm using this notation so I don't have to write out all slots and all numbers. Then I have a common factor of V in these two pieces. So I can factor this out.
and say a minus lambda i times v is equal to zero. And now I see what I'm seeking. Is a v always equal to three v? No, I can make plenty of examples like that. But if I have an eigenvalue, and if I have a special vector, four one did the trick, one minus two did not. So if I choose the right value and the right vector, then matrix multiplication will be the same as scalar multiplication. And here's the criteria. I need to solve this equation. Now let's go back to writing in matrix, full matrix mode, A, B, C, D, that's the A. Lambda zero, zero lambda. That's the lambda I times, let's say V is just X, Y. That's the vector V, the special vector I seek. And the zero vector is zero, zero. So what I'm doing when I try to set up this equation, let me slide down to the next paper. Sorry. Try to keep things centered. What I'm doing is trying to solve this equation, a minus lambda, b, c, d minus lambda times x, y equals zero, zero. Now I got to understand what this represents, but you see I've made the a minus lambda b, c, d minus lambda. All I did is take a, b, c, d, subtract lambda zero, zero, lambda. That's how I created this matrix. But let's think about in general, if I have alpha x plus beta y, gamma x plus delta y equals zero. What are these two things? These are two lines. These are two lines in standard form. In fact, because of the zero and zero here, these are two lines in standard form, and I even know more about them. They go through the origin. I know they go through the origin because if I put zero and zero in for X and Y, I get zero. Regardless of what alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are, I get zero in both cases. So what I have here are two lines, you can call them L1 and L2 if you like. And these two lines, L1 and L2, are meeting at the origin. You could say the origin is the solution to this system. Now lines don't always cross, but if you have two lines that go through the origin, you can bet they cross, they cross at the origin. Lines sometimes cross at more than one place. You know, if you're really unlucky, you might have the same line twice. So we could have the same line through the origin twice. But what would it take for these two lines, L1 and L2, to be the same line through the origin? Are they the same line? Well, if they were the same line through the origin, like that and like that, this is a crude drawing. They'd have to have what? They'd have to have the same slope. That's the only way they could be the same line. Since they share the point at the origin, they'd be the same line if they had the same slope. So what's the slope of each one of these lines? The slope of this line, if you solve for y, is minus alpha over beta. The slope of this line is minus gamma over delta. Or if you cross multiplied, you wouldn't have to deal with the minus signs, alpha delta is beta gamma. 
Now notice when I said alpha, delta, beta, gamma, I was referring to this alpha, beta, gamma, delta here. Just arbitrary numbers, but I've got four numbers right here. So when is this equation solvable? Let's solve this equation, triple star here. I could certainly solve it with x and y is zero, zero. If I put zero and zero in here and multiply, of course I get zero and zero. This is true, but it's not interesting. It's essentially useless. Well, of course they cross at zero, zero. I can't do anything with zero, zero, it's just a dot. But I want to know if there's another. Is there a non-zero answer? And there will be a non-zero answer if these two lines have the same slope. So let's take this slope criterion. Uh, let's take this slope criterion, excuse me. Alpha, delta, beta, gamma. Let's take it to here. This is the right, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So alpha, delta is A minus lambda, B minus lambda. And beta gamma is BC. So I want to find the moment where these two are equal. Another way to say that is multiply everything out and set this equal to zero. Let's multiply this out. Lambda times lambda, negative lambda times negative lambda is lambda squared. But then I have negative a lambda, negative d lambda, that's negative a plus d lambda. And then I have a times d, which is a constant, but I'll subtract the bc over to this side. And then I get this massive surprise. When can I find non-zero solutions to the system? When I solve this equation, but what is A plus D? It's the trace of the original matrix, A, B, C, D. And what's A, D minus B, C? It's the determinant of the original matrix, A, D, B, C. So the magic lambdas that do this job for me are the eigenvalues, the solutions to this equation, the solutions to the characteristic equation are the eigenvalues. And now one more surprise is going to come out. Where did I get this very sympathetic for one? Well, let's go back to our problem. And I'm running out of space, so I'll write this carefully and then we'll drop down. Two, four, one minus one. That was the A. Trace was one, determinant was minus six. I'm repeating, lambda squared minus trace lambda plus determinant equals zero was lambda squared minus one lambda minus six equals zero. That gave me the lambda minus three and the lambda plus two. But now let's do this A minus lambda I trick. The A minus lambda I, is called, in most cases, people call this the adjusted matrix. It's not the original matrix A, but I'm trying to solve this problem. A minus lambda I 
times V equals zero. And what I'm getting is I need to form this, not A, but adjusted matrix A minus lambda I. So I know my two lambdas, right? My two lambdas are lambda one and lambda two. I'll move my paper up, I'm sorry. My two lambdas are lambda one is three, lambda two is minus two. So let me write the adjusted matrix for those two lambdas. All that means is I subtract lambda on the main diagonal as I did up here. So on the main diagonal, and you got to do this very carefully, let's subtract three on this main diagonal. I get negative one, negative four. The other two numbers are unchanged, four and one. Let's subtract minus two on the main diagonal. Now remember I said subtract minus two. So this becomes four, two minus negative two. This becomes one, negative one minus negative two. This becomes four and one. These two numbers are unchanged. But now I want you to solve matrix equation for me. And I don't even want you to solve a nasty matrix equation. What do I want to do? I want to find the special vectors that this matrix kills. Uh, mathematics is a very martial subject. I mean, there was a reason Napoleon employed Laplace and other mathematicians like them. He wanted them to aim as cannons. Mathematicians from the beginning has been very warlike and, and probably haven't atoned for all those sins. So here's an old language. When I multiply a matrix times a vector and get zero, zero, some people say this matrix annihilates the vector, kills the vector, because it sends it to zero, zero. Zero, zero is like no life, you know, zero, zero. So I say to you, can you name a matrix, a vector that this matrix kills? And I say, that is the easiest thing for you to do because you remember how to do dot products. And you remember when the dot product was zero, two matrix, two vectors were perpendicular. So what's perpendicular to one and four, negative one, four? Perpendicular to negative one, four is four and one. Multiply minus one, four times four, one. You get negative four plus four is zero. Multiply one minus four times four, one. You get four minus four is zero. Here's the vector for one that I seemly, seemingly randomly plucked from the air earlier. Do you see the vector for one was not a random vector? It belonged to the three. The language we use right here is that for one is an eigenvector. It's the eigenvector that belongs to the eigenvalue three. It's the unique vector that belongs to the unique value three. Try it again on the second one. See four, four, one, one. I bet you could pick out two numbers that would produce zero, zero. And then you remembered how to do any dot product. Like if I want three and seven and I wanted to dot it with something to get zero, you know how to do that. All I have to do is switch the two numbers and change one of the signs. Three, seven dotted with seven minus three is 21 minus 21, zero. This is the easiest way I can pick out perpendicular vectors. So do the same thing for me here. Switch the two numbers, change one of the signs. I could say four and minus four. But since I'm lazy, and since I want to do as little work as possible, remember, job of a mathematician is to not calculate. So I change this to one and minus one. This is definitely an eigenvector. And it's a really simple looking one one and minus one. This 
eigenvector 1 minus 1 belongs to the eigenvalue minus 2. This eigenvector 4, 1 belongs to the eigenvalue 3. Let's take the matrix 2, 4, 1 minus 1. That was the original A, right? And let's multiply it by 1 minus 1. So when I take 2, 4, 1 minus 1 and multiply it by 1 minus 1, Look what I get. 2 subtract 4 is negative 2. And 1 plus 1 is positive 2. What did I get? A scaled version of 1 minus 1. What's scaling? That's scaling the magic value. Now, this is almost all linear algebra in one speech. But of course, it goes much, much farther than that. But the most important problem in linear algebra is the search for eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So important, and you may have heard this before, that that's how Sergey Brin and Eric Schmidt become multi-multi-billionaires. A much more complicated way, but what Sergey Brin and Eric Schmidt did for web search was they found a way to reducing searching for a phrase or word on the web to solving an eigenvalue eigenvector problem. Now, for them, it was a larger matrix, a larger eigenvector, you know, maybe extremely large. But Google's search algorithm is simply built on optimizing a special eigenvector. They did it first. They get the credit. They get too much credit in a sense, right? Because, like... Now they just do it to suck out your information and make money. I don't know if that's a common good. Let's summarize. I have matrix 2, 4, 1, minus 1. I have trace, determinant. I'm going to show you more special things. Hang on. I have characteristic equation, lambda squared, minus lambda minus six. Notice I have eigenvalues of three and minus two. And I have eigenvectors of four, one, and one minus one. If a matrix had a driver's license, then this is what it would look like, right? You have a driver's license. It identifies you. It makes you a responsible party to drive a car. It has all your key information on it as far as driving a car is concerned, as far as you know, legally operating a vehicle in the state of Michigan or any other state. Matrices cannot legally operate vehicles, but they can do other things for us. And this is what I need to know about this matrix. So from now on, whenever someone hands you a two by two matrix, you're going to immediately write down its trace, determinant, characteristic equation. From there, you'll work out its eigenvalues. And from there, you'll work out its eigenvectors. And then you'll know everything about that matrix that you need to solve differential equations. And now I will demonstrate. So let's take the system. X, Y prime equals, sorry, interruption. Get back to my paper, two, four, 1 minus 1, x, y. Or, in the old style, dx dt is 2x plus 4y. 
and dy dt is x minus y. This is my linear system. Well, now I will tell you two independent solutions to the system on which I can base all other solutions. Last week, I gave you that example for a second order problem. I said the y1 and v1, the y2 and v2 that we wrote in our earlier example right here, y1, v1, the y2, v2. I said those were independent solutions to this problem, and I could base all other solutions off of that y1 and y2. Notice how they came from a quadratic equation. Now I'll show you the two independent solutions to this system. And it's so cheap that you're going to be amazed. If I have eigen, sorry, I'm not using that one fourth anymore. If I have eigenvalue lambda is three, an eigenvector for three is four, one, then this is a solution to this system. Do you remember last week when I showed you how to differentiate this and then multiply by the vector? Go ahead and check. Check that this solves system star. The other solution is eigenvalue minus two and eigenvector one minus one. This also solves star. Now your first reaction to that is, whoa, that's crazy. Whoa, that's too simple. This is page seven. So we're gonna have to do deeper, right? Or else we would just stop the course right here. Even you suspect, and now we're going to end our session in a minute or two. Even you suspect that there must be more to this. Because if it was this easy, why would we have nine more weeks? Well, remember the problems you can have solving one of these. Right? Sometimes you don't get two answers. Sometimes you only get one answer repeated. Then what are you going to do? Sometimes you get complex numbers for the answer. What would the eigenvalues and eigenvectors look like if these were complex numbers? You know, really, you're going to get multiple, multiple cases here. And I'm only showing you the best case scenario. Let's look at the vector four and one as time goes on, this number becomes super huge. Remember the speech I gave you next week or uh, last week, and I shoot out of the origin along the vector four and one. Look at the vector one and minus one. Since this is negative eigenvalue. As time goes forward, this becomes small, and I shoot into the origin along this vector. Now, really, instead of 4 and 1, I could have chosen minus 4 and minus 1. So these going out, or I could have chosen minus 1 and 1 going in. These are what's called the straight line solutions. You understand what they do now. Go and take this problem to the Mathematica notebooks I've given you. And what you have is you have an equilibrium point where solutions, these straight line solutions, divide the plane into pieces. And the flow of the ocean in this piece is like this.
the flow of the ocean in this quadrant is like that. The flow of the ocean in this quadrant is like this. And the flow of the ocean in this quadrant is like this. You have a word for this. You can type it in the chat if you want. What's the word for this shape you saw in Calc 3? Excellent. I was going to demand one letter at a time because I love to play Wheel of Fortune. Yes, it's a saddle. Now, do you understand? When we were doing phase lines, you either had source or sink or node. But we're through with one dimension. One dimension was boring. Now we're in two dimensions. And one of the things that can happen is a saddle. If I had both lines going in, I would still call that a sink. If I had both lines going out, I would still call that a source. But now you see the purpose of section 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 to introduce you to not sink, source, source sink node, but source sink saddle. In two dimensions, source and the sink and the saddle are kind of like the source and the sink and the node here. Now, bad news. These are the only things that could happen in one dimension. In two dimensions, there's actually 13 cases that you have to learn. And now you've learned the first three. But they're beautiful, they're visual, and I promise you, you won't have a hard time learning the cases. These are just the different ways that the ocean can flow in two dimensions. These are the different ways the ocean can flow in one dimension, kind of boring. Okay, but you see the central role will always be played by the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. I have to explain how you should deal with the crazy eigenvalues and the crazy eigenvectors, which we will. But I promise you that the solutions will always be built out of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. You can look at section three, one, three, two, and three, three and play with them this week. You could do the problems in them now. But I don't mind if you want to focus on the exam. That's I want you to put most of your attention to the exam. You won't hand in problems from this until the following week. And we'll have time to come back and study this idea to make you really believe that these are solutions. Okay. I, this is not my preferred way of operating. I'm much happier to see you in person, but I thought this was better than just like saying to you, sorry, you lost a night especially in a once a week course. I was very, very upset when I finally drug myself into the Midland Center and they said, oh, didn't you hear that they canceled? Okay, I'm gonna post these papers. I'm gonna post these videos. You have a good night. And uh, check back for your exam, maybe by 11 o'clock. Start reading it. Think about it, sleep on it. Send me questions and we'll help you get started. I would say you wanna address it right away. It's not gonna be like homework problems where you can just do it on the day before, which is not your habit, but I'm saying let's dig into that exam. Okay, have a nice night. I'll see you guys next week, hopefully.